and many of you are probably familiar with Tucker's work. Tucker's been at the forefront of investigating the omega-6 fatty acid, linoleic acid, for about 10 years or so. And during this time, he's been a conduit between helping the general public really understand the complex biochemistry and what's in the available literature about how these oils affect our health. And I think Tuck has been really instrumental in growing the understanding and acceptance that it's not just carbohydrates in our diet that contribute to disease, but that omega-6 oils are playing a really important role as well, and maybe the combination of the two. So I'm going to let Tucker tell you his personal story and then share some of the discoveries he's made. So thank you so much for coming along. It's a pleasure, Susan. Thank you so much for your kind introduction to your audience and for having having me on your podcast. Um, I am probably the least likely person to ever get an interest in diet research. Um, up until I myself got sick, I studiously avoided learning anything about it. Having grown up with a mother who struggled with weight and Weight Watchers for years to little uh, effect, um, I followed the dietary guidelines in large part and at one point referred to myself as Mr. Whole Wheat, um, thinking that, you know, they must have done the research, so that was probably the right way to go. And it wasn't until I had a few uh, rather unpleasant illnesses myself and spent a variety of trips through the hospital system that I realized I had to start looking into it um, myself because they, you know, nobody else would. Um, and what I found led to a resolution of all of my personal health problems and made me very curious to try to understand why doing the reverse of what I was told to do made me get so much better so quickly. Would you, would you be willing to talk a little bit about those personal health problems you had? Because they were fairly significant. Sure. Um, the first, uh, the first thing that really got my attention was I had what was initially diagnosed as a stroke when I was 38 years old and symptoms were partial blindness about, I lost the vision on the right third of my visual field. Um, I discovered this when I was driving down the highway and there were a car all of a sudden popped into existence right in front of me and I couldn't figure out where it had come from. And when I looked over to my right, I was able to see that there was a long line of cars coming up an entrance ramp. And if I looked straight ahead, I couldn't see them all. I had a complete blind spot. Um, well, that was rather odd, but I was, you know, rushing to get to the office. So I decided to ignore it. <laughs> and luckily nothing bad happened. Um, and then once I got to work, I got on a conference call and discovered partway through the conference call that I was having trouble speaking. Um, I could understand what people were saying and could formulate answers in my head, but couldn't get my mouth to say them. So this was rather disconcerting. Um, my <laughs> as, as you'll find out on this podcast, I'm verbose and don't generally don't have a problem with talking. <laughs> and... Uh, so I managed to say, you know, I'm not feeling well, I have to excuse myself. And then I went to my boss and told him that I was having trouble speaking. And fortunately, one of the fellows we worked with had been an emergency medical technician prior to coming to work with us. And he diagnosed it as a stroke that I was in the middle of having and popped me in his car and drove me to the local stroke ward um, where I spent the next four days hanging out with the stroke professor and his students. Um, they were thrilled to have me there, as they said to me, as one of the students said to me, you're so interesting. All the people that we see in here are old and you're young. And I was like, oh, great. This is really wonderful. The last thing you want to hear when you're in the care of a medical professional is you're interesting. 
<laughs> um, so they ran all the standard stroke tests over the next several months and everything came back negative, leaving the professor to, he was, you know, a doctor of neurology and also a professor with a specialty in stroke at this teaching hospital. His final diagnosis of me was, wow, that's weird. Thanks, doc. Um, and he was excellent. He really Interesting was. And weird. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So, um, I was able to do enough research uh, while I was trying to understand what was going on to me to get him to change his diagnosis from a stroke to a migraine. Um, and he said to me, I've never changed a diagnosis because of information that a patient has given me. But professionally at the time, I was the chief technology officer of a top 100 in the world hedge fund in New York. And was largely self-taught in the field of technology and, you know, was quite used to having to do research in depth to figure out what was going on and what I needed to do and was quite used to having to live by the results of those, of that research. So, you know, starting looking at a new field to me, wasn't really a change in uh, a dramatic change from what I was used to doing. So I said, okay, I need to learn about this. Um, but unfortunately it took a few more years before I figured out what was going on. Although he did change the diagnosis to a migraine after I had another, uh, series of symptoms that looked like migraine. Um, and after I'd found some papers that indicated that this was a plausible explanation for what had happened to me. Uh, and that's, you know, if you're not familiar with the disease progression of stroke, generally, once you have one, you're going to have more. And I was left with a minor speech impediment from that. Yes, you can have a speech impediment from a migraine. Who knew? He thought it was normal, but I was rather surprised by that. Luckily, it's something I've gotten over as time went on. Um, so two years later, I came down with acute diverticulitis. Uh, diverticulitis is basically um, an infectious condition in your colon. It becomes acute when your colon perforates and the contents of your colon leak out into your abdominal cavity, which is a very bad situation to be in. Um, off, can be fatal. Uh, obviously, luckily in my condition, it was not. Um, that led to another four day journey to a different hospital and uh, a series of discussions with the surgeon there where he told me what my options were, all of which were pretty unpleasant. Um, but luckily he was a very, also a very talented medical professional and managed to avoid having to cut me open and doing a colon resection on the spot, which would have left me bed bound for probably six months or six weeks to recover from. So. Um, one of the things he told me was, oh, you're not going to be able to eat fatty fried foods anymore. And I looked at him mystified and I was like, I haven't been able to eat that stuff for 20 years. It makes me nauseous. I was like, I, you know, a healthy diet, salads, whole wheat bread. I mean, I'm a healthy guy, doc. And, uh, he just kind of shrugged and, um, which in my experience has been the typical reaction from a medical professional when you tell them something that doesn't correspond with their teaching. Um, I got the same reaction from the uh, uh, doctor who did the colonoscopy to prepare me for the uh, colon resection that I had to have six months later. Um, I said, is this, you know, do you think the surgery is going to cure this 16 years of chronic diarrhea I'd had at that point, which is one of the symptoms, as I later learned of a gluten intolerance and um, from reading the medical journals that apparently he hadn't read. Um, and he just shrugged. He didn't know if it would help, but you know, for the diverticulitis, it was thought to be the thing to do. Um, but at any rate, uh, so I had the colon surgery and uh, still had the diverticulitis symptoms, um, which in my case, included pain and cramping and occasionally passing out, which is not a lot of fun. So a couple of years after that, 
that was 40 years, uh, 40 years old when I had the acute diverticulitis. I was lying in the hospital with my phone trying to research the condition. And they said, typically, again, occurs in older people, but can present as young as 40 years old. I was two weeks past my 40th birthday, <laughs> which really left me very upset. Um, my plan on life had been to be healthy to an old age, like my parents and my grandparents. And all of a sudden here I am, you know, in my late thirties, early forties, getting all the diseases of old age. This was not the plan. Um, so a couple of years after that, a friend of mine or an acquaintance and friend of mine, um, sent me a link to this PhD student's blog, Stefan Guillenet, and I started reading what he had to say. And after, you know, as a skeptic, uh, reading all the studies that he linked to, and after several months decided to apply one of his changes to my own personal diet, which was removing seed oils. And the uh, long-term irritable bowel syndrome, the chronic diarrhea, which had, you know, not been resolved by the colon resection miraculously disappeared in two days, um, which absolutely blew my mind. And I started to lose weight. I started to feel much better. Everybody at work started to asking me, started asking me, you know, what are you doing? Um, why do you look so much healthier? And I, lost my craving for carbohydrates. I was, you know, as a typical person putting on about a pound a year. So I was 20 pounds overweight by, you know, my early forties. And I suddenly just, I tried doing on a low carb diet before and had failed because I couldn't get over the carbohydrate cravings. And when I dropped the seed oils, all of a sudden I just lost interest. I forgot for a week to eat any carbohydrates until I had a sandwich with whole wheat bread at the end of the week. And I quickly discovered that I was seriously gluten intolerant. And that turned out to be the cause of most of the strokes and symptoms and the seed oils turned out to be a large part of the cause of the irritable bowel disease, which went away pretty quickly. So all of a sudden, all of my health problems resolved, including ones that I never really realized were health problems like a predilection to sunburn. So it's been interesting. And being a skeptic and being curious, I started researching why all this stuff had happened to me and why um, doing the reverse, going on a high fat, low carb diet managed to cure all of my illnesses when that's the exact reverse of what we're told to do. I mean, at one point I went to my doctor and I told him that I was doing this and he expressed his concern. And I said, well, that's great, doc. That's why I'm here. You can do the tests and tell me if I'm killing myself. And shortly before I fired him because I didn't need him anymore, he told me he thought I'd live to a hundred years old, that I was, you know, as healthy as I could be. So that was uh, the short version of my health adventure. <laughs> well, health misadventures, but it's been fortunate for the rest of us that this happened because, you know, you've made such a huge contribution. So and that was, you know, I'm 53 now and that, so it's been 10 plus years into it. And um, I'm now uh, engaged to be married to a nurse who uh, Susan just met before we started this call. She's out on a run. And it was quite amusing at one point when we, we were friends in high school and got back together recently. And she started asking me, you know, what drugs I was on. And I was like, I'm not on any drugs. She's like, you don't take pills. I was like, I haven't taken a pill in 10 years. Why would I need to take a pill? I mean, I don't take pain meds. I don't take, you know, all of which was true until last spring. Unfortunately, when I got bit by a tick and had to go on a course of antibiotics to get over what could have been a case of Lyme disease. But so my 10 year streak of no drugs got broke by a tick. <laughs> Say <Say-lo-fi. laughs> But she was blown away that I could actually be living in America and not need any medication or any medical attention for 10 years. What on earth is wrong with us, with us that we've gotten to the point where that's surprising? I know. I mean, I'm 62. I don't take any drugs. And 
people are always surprised that you haven't got a list of medications that you're taking. And I, I'm always surprised that people take so many, you know. Um, what do you need? Oh, yeah. Before, you know? Yeah. So you mentioned seed oil. Well, so we've got the whole gluten wheat thing, which I think is another interesting um, topic. But you mentioned the seed oils, which is really what I'd love your you to get across to everybody today. So could you give us a bit of a basic background into what they are? You know, we're told that omega-6 and omega-3s are essential fatty acids. If you could just give a little bit of, of a background, where they come from and sort of what you've found about, you know, how they cause inflammation and, and, and are contributing to so many of these health issues that we're having. Sure. Um, one quick note on the wheat thing. I did a lot of research into that initially because I thought, uh, and basically what I found out was that unless you have autoimmune conditions, if you have autoimmune conditions, there's a pretty high correlation with some kind of wheat intolerance, whether it's celiac or something else like what I have. So if, if you fit that definition, then I would seriously, you know, I, trial at least a gluten-free diet. I've seen people have a major benefit from that. Um, but I don't know that that's, I don't think that that's the cause of the bulk of the chronic diseases that we see uh, nowadays. But for certain people, it can, like me, it can have a major impact. Um, the seed oil question, <laughs> excuse me. Um, seed oils are, were introduced into the human diet largely in industrial scale back in the 1800s. Uh, and prior to that, it was a pretty rare fat in our diet. Um, seed, the omega-6 fats that are um, a particular interest to chronic disease are produced by plants and then they bioaccumulate in animals that eat plants. Um, animals can't make them themselves. So they tend to be in a natural environment, you know, 1% or less of the content of the food that we eat um, until industrial processing led to the creation of seed oils where we can now extract the fats I mean, for instance, when one eats corn, you don't think of it as being an oily food, right? Unlike say an olive. Um, and to make corn oil, you have to extract a lot of oil, a tiny bit of oil from a lot of corn. So if you're, you know, unlike olive oil where you can squeeze the oil out, you don't do that with corn. You need some level of industrial processing. And as a result of that, we've increased the amount of omega-6 fats that we consume over the last hundred odd years to probably 20 plus times the normal, the natural level. Um, this is a problem because these fats are, they're polyunsaturated fats, which means they don't have a, uh, unlike a saturated fat, like what you would find in beef tallow or a bar of soap, um, they don't have a full complement of hydrogen atoms and a fat is like a ladder with a bunch of carbons down the middle and a bunch of hydrogens down the side. And an unsaturated fat is mixing one or more hydrogen atoms. And what the problem with that is it makes them very susceptible to oxidative damage. Oxygen can bind to those sites where they're missing a hydrogen atom and break the fat into subcomponents. And some of these subcomponents are highly toxic. Um, our bodies are perfectly well adapted to this process in terms of a natural diet. Um, that's why we, you know, one of the reasons why our body makes antioxidants is to deal with the oxidation of these omega-6 fats. Um, it's such an probably the most important, uh, antioxidant in our body is called glutathione. And this is such a fundamental part of our life that if you are born with an inability, well, if you're genetically unable to make glutathione, you won't be born, you'll die uh, as a fetus. It's 
you know, so this is something that we're well adapted to handling if we have an appropriate intake of these fats. Um, what seems to be the case now is that we are consuming so much more of it that we exceed the detoxification capacity of our body. And this has caused a variety of different health issues. Uh, in my research, most of the chronic diseases, all the chronic diseases have some component of what they call uh, oxidative stress or lipid peroxidation, which is the process of these omega-6 fats breaking down into toxins in your body and causing you know, everything from insulin resistance to obesity, to heart disease, to genetic damage that leads to cancer. We'll move on and talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. But you mentioned that these fats have only been in our diet for say the last 120 years. And that in terms of them coming from these processed seed oils that we're eating, and you talked about the quantity, what prior to the introduction of seed oils, what sort of quantities, what sort of percentage of our diets were we looking at? Single digit percentage. I mean, there's an argument over whether we need um, the major fat that's of interest to us in seed oils is called linoleic acid. And it was long thought to be an essential fatty acid and essential in nutrition science means something that your body has to have, but can't make itself. So for instance, for instance, water is an essential nutrient, right? You have to have water, your body can't make water, so you must consume it. So some scientists did some research back in the 1930s that led them to think that linoleic acid was essential, which is part of why they say, oh, you need to eat lots of it because if a little bit's good, a lot must be better, right? Um, recently they've thought that maybe it's not essential. Um, and if it is essential, it's essential in such a tiny amount that, I mean, it's important to note that all foods naturally contain some omega-6 fats. So you're always going to get enough really, unless you're under the care of a physician or you're in a scientist's lab, you will never not get enough omega-6 fats in your diet. Um, but we, you know, so you'll get a tiny amount, which is what your body needs on a natural foods, a whole foods diet. The problem is when you start eating these refined industrial food products and you're getting, you know, 10, 20 times what your body expects. We hear a lot about the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And I think people are getting well-versed that, you know, we don't want to exceed our omega-6 to our omega-3s. But what about the total quantity as well? Because that's what you were talking about here, isn't it? Is the total amount of omega-6. Yeah, what's so, important to note about the ratio is that really the important number in the ratio is the omega-6 intake, which for anybody living in an industrial country is going to be far too high. Um, omega-6 fats and omega-3 fats compete in your body. So if you are eating too much omega-6 fats, you are not going to be able to eat enough omega-3 fats to outcompete the effects of the omega-6 fats. So this has been shown, for instance, in the leading cause of blindness, which is age-related macular degeneration. And that's one of the few medical conditions now where they will say explicitly that you need to reduce your omega-6 consumption because what they found in when they tried to, that's a condition that's where the breakdown of these polyunsaturated fat uh, fats in the retina of your eye causes the retina to break down and that's what leads to blindness. So the first thing they tried to do was to add omega-3 fats. Um, and what they discovered was that adding omega-3 fats didn't make a difference. But what did make a difference was the people who had low omega-6 fat intake, that they weren't getting this disease at all. So you can't take enough. The ratio the ratio really isn't important if you're taking, if you're eating too much omega-6. It just, you know, you, 
you can't overcome the negative effects of too much omega-6 with uh, fish oil or fish consumption. The reason I ask about that is because we're hearing all about this new canola oil, you know, that's got a good omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, you know, two, a two to one ratio or something. But, which, which canola oil is that? Oh, the new sort of genetically modified canola oils that are coming out that are that are making you know health claims based on their omega-6 to omega-3 ratios and right. you know that still worries me because people are then thinking they're doing the right thing by using canola oil or by using these new canola oils um, but really they're still just overloading their omega-6 intake well, yes, canola oil is one of the better seed oils because it's got less omega-6. It's ironic, though, that what industry is very well aware of the problems that I'm describing. Some of the most interesting papers I've read on the problems with omega-6 fats are published in industry journals. Um, so the breeding and GMO efforts that they're doing with canola oil, ironically, are geared at reducing the omega-3 fats in them and reducing the omega-6 fats and increasing oleic acid, which is the fat that's commonly found in uh, olive oil, right? So they're lowering both the omega-6 and omega-3 content of canola oil, in part because they both you know, they're well aware that they break down into toxins. And when you're using them as a frying oil, for instance, in a restaurant, it's a real issue. That's one of the reasons why they have to keep changing their oils is because these polyunsaturated fats break down into toxins in the uh, fryer and the, what they're breaking down into is toxic and they're required by most health authorities to get rid of it after a few days. So... <laughs> So yeah, canola oil, if you don't have a better option, is one of the better uh, seed oils, but I think you're better off just, it still has a lot more omega-6 fats than we're used to consuming. And the, the additional issue is that the omega-3 fat that it has is not what your body expects. And while we can convert it into the longer chain uh, omega-3 fats that are found in fish. Um, most people are not very good at it. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the more common human genetic adaptations is found in people from the Indian subcontinent. And it's an ability to process these fat, these plant-based N3 fats into longer chain ones, because they are so essential to health. Essential enough that people who've been on a vegetarian diet for generations have specific adaptations to uh, try and protect them against the lack of these fats that their body expects. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So what happens when these fats are oxidized? Can you talk about sort of the toxins that are released and that inflammatory process? Yes. Um, so probably the most eye-opening example of this. Everybody knows that smoking causes lung cancer, right? One of the things that is thought to cause lung cancer from smoking is a chemical called acrolein. Um, acrolein, if you go read the Wikipedia page, it's very entertaining, <laughs> I guess you could call it, or disheartening, um, is what's known as a biocide. It's a high capacity toxin for any living matter, right? And one of the reasons it causes genetic damage, which is, it's thought, one of the reasons why smoking causes genetic damage and cancer is because of chemical chemicals like acrolein. Well, it turns out that another major cause of lung cancer is cooking with seed oils, which also break down into acrolein. So in China, for instance, where a lot of this research has been done, seed oil consumption has been recognized since the 1980s as a leading cause of lung cancer in women who don't smoke. And because they use so much of it as a frying fat, the rate of lung cancer in China 
amongst non-smoking women is twice what it is in America. So there are some other chemicals um, for hydroxynononol, commonly referred to as HNE, and malondialdehyde, referred to as MDA, which are also, um, they don't quite seem to be carcinogens, but they seem to accelerate uh, cancer growth. So HNE preferentially, um, and that's not my word, that's the word used in the scientific literature, mutates our anti-cancer gene to disable the body's ability to protect itself against cancer. This is the most common genetic mutation found in 50% of cancers. Um, Beg your pardon? That's the P53 gene? The P53 gene, right. It's known as the anti-cancer gene, the anti-tumorogenesis gene. So clearly breaking that gene would be a bad thing. Um, and it's one of the reasons why what are known as the Western cancers, the cancers that appear in industrial societies um, are the ones with the highest incidence of the, this mutation, the breaking the P53 gene. So yeah, eating, you know, I mean, eating something that turns into cancer promoting chemicals, one would think would be a no brainer for a bad idea to do. And the fact that, you know, this connection between lung cancer and, uh, cooking with seed oils has been known since the 1980s, leaves one rather mystified why you can go on to, you know, go look at a bottle of Mazzola corn oil and it says it's heart healthy, but it fails to mention that it's a known human carcinogen and has been known so for decades. And so the temperature of, that these oils get to is important, just in terms, and is it correct, like can they be, can um, linoleic acid be oxidized at body temperature, is that correct? Did I read that somewhere? Yes, linoleic acid is oxidized at body temperature. Um, I mean, it was initially thought that uh, this was a problem only in cooked fats, but it's since been shown that uh, the omega-6 fats will break down in the body, um, specifically in the mitochondria where they're, they accumulate um, as part of mitochondrial function. Um, there are some very interesting animal studies showing that simply, so mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, right? It's what differentiates a higher life form, higher than a bacteria from a bacteria. It's the power source that allows multiple cells to get together and work with each other. Um, there are animal models showing that simply giving a mouse, say, seed oils as part of its diet will cause mitochondria to break down. And one of the interesting aspects of our chronic diseases is that they all seem to involve some sort of mitochondrial dysfunction, which it's been shown, you know, can be caused simply by the consumption of seed oils. Um, if you really want to make it bad, then you give the mouse hyperglycemia and that causes, you know, some of the symptoms that we see in end stage human diseases, like uh, the necrosis that's seen in uh, heart failure and neurological diseases, where these toxins break down at such a high rate in the body that they overwhelm the body's ability to detoxify them and start killing off cells. Sounds pretty frightening, to be honest. Yes, I mean, you know, people, justifiably are so concerned about quote unquote eating clean and trying to get organic foods and uh, low pesticide residues while they're at the same time not aware of the fact that they are consuming high amounts of something that breaks down into some incredibly tox toxic substances in our body, just as the normal course of consumption. What about the accumulation of these fats in our body fat? How, how is that affecting us? Is that, is that adding to the obesity crisis? And is that adding to the issues that people have in losing weight, even when they're sort of restricting calories or, as you say, eating clean? Yeah, and it does, 
it bio, as I mentioned before, these fats are made by animals and they concentrate in, or these fats are made by plants and they concentrate when animals eat them. So as you move higher up the food chain, um, you're going to eat more and more of these fats if they're at a high level in the diet of the things you're eating, like say industrial industrially raised chicken or pork or salmon. Um, there's a very interesting study looking at farm raised salmon in Norway where they're fed a uh, soybean meal. Um, and they found that this did cause uh, fat accumulation, obesity and inflammation in the salmon. And then when they fed the salmon to mice, the mice exhibited the same symptoms. So the effects bioaccumulate up the food chain, which is, you know, in, interesting in that it's similar to DDT and one of the reasons that DDT was banned decades ago because it bioaccumulated up. Um, so there's a great study, The I mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, the PhD student whose blog I followed, uh, Stefan Guianet, well, he went on to become a scientist and co-wrote a paper looking at the accumulation of uh, N6 fats, omega-6 fats in human adipose tissue over the 20th century. And sure enough, it's gone up steadily as consumption's gone up. Now, this is a problem because these fats break down whenever they're stored. So you're, you know, ver they will simply break down with time. So if you're trying to store them in your fat cells, they will then break down. And many of the symptoms that we see in obese people um, obesity as an inflammatory element where your body is actually attacking the fat cells. Um, and one of the primary reasons why this will happen is these omega-6 fats, when they break down into these toxins are indistinguishable to, from your, to your body from a bacterial, uh, infection, the signal what's called a pathogen associated molecular pattern is identical. And our bodies actually are genetically programmed to react to these patterns because they're the same patterns that are in bacteria like staph. Um, so effectively what we're doing is inducing an autoimmune disease in ourselves, right? These fats break down into things that our body can't tell from a bacterial infection and starts, it starts affecting the cells, right? This is what's seen in atherosclerosis, in obesity, in the fat cells, and in some neurological conditions. And, is, and this is contributing to insulin resistance as well? Well, that's, yeah. So uh, if you want to induce insulin resistance in a person, there's a scientist, Gerald Schulman at Yale University who knows exactly how to do this. And he does it by injecting them with soybean oil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's been shown by other him and other researchers that the active ingredient in the soybean oil that is causing the body to become insulin resistant is the linoleic acid. Um, yeah. So, which sort of explains why, uh, I mean, one of the things, one of the many interesting things in Gary Taubes' book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which came out a rather frightening amount of years ago now at this point, was that diabetes used to be a very rare disease. Um, and then over the course of the second half of the 19th and the 20th century, it became an incredibly common disease. Uh, and we now know that, you know, one of the main symptoms of type two diabetes is insulin resistance. And we now know that in a animal model or in a human model, you can induce insulin resistance by injecting omega-6 fats. Um, and then we have a diet high in omega-6 fats with these processed foods, they're all got, you know, wheat, sugar, omega-6 fats combination really yes we've yes i've heard them called the three horsemen of the apocalypse the perfect form <laughs> of which is the donut <laughs> oh and that reminds me of a photograph i sent last week of the new zealand breast cancer foundations um funding a, a, a campaign and 
it's sitting over a pa over in a cafe over a, a box of donuts you know buy a donut and donate to the to the breast cancer foundation yeah it's unbelievable it just blows your mind i mean donuts are delicious don't get me wrong and i would like to see somebody try and create a healthy donut um <laughs> the first step in which would be not to fry them in vegetable oils and i mean this you know this is you know when you read the industry literature the, a major research topic in industry for the last couple of decades has been how to reduce the toxins that are produced in fryer fats. And it's all involved in breeding and genetic modification of these plants to lower the uh, omega-6 linoleic acid content in the seed oils. So this is, you know, I mean, it's not well known, but it's not controversial. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite studies and the connections between these fats and obesity in the human models, it's a little more difficult to tell. There haven't been a lot of great studies done to try and tease this out, but in the animal models, it's just unquestionable that they cause obesity. I mean, my favorite article that I came across in an industry uh, bioengineering journal was titled genetically modified plenish soybean oil is less obesogenic than regular soybean oil. Less obesogenic? <laughs> That's their selling point. It's yeah. less obesogenic. Um, interestingly, in that experiment, they used coconut oil as the non-obesogenic control. Coconut oil, which has been called by a Harvard University epidemi uh, epidemiology researcher as quote unquote, pure poison. So how you rationalize, I mean, the biggest health problem we have in the world is obesity and diabetes and coconut oil apparently doesn't cause it. So why would you call that pure poison when soybean oil, which does cause it, is marketed to all of us as being the healthy alternative? It's mad. Well, I've got my first real introduction to fats was Mary Ng's book, No, You're Fat. Mary Ng, yes, who worked with the Western Price Foundation for a yeah. long time. And, I mean, this book was published in 2000, and she's already talking, like, back in the 1980s, 1995, you know, so many studies and research showing that saturated fat is not the issue. It is these omega-6 and these polyunsaturated fats in excess, you know. I mean, we've known this stuff for such a long time. Oh, well, it's been known, but it is unfortunately, um, you know, there's unfortunately a major contradiction in between what we're told to eat or through the dietary guidelines and what the research shows we ought to be eating. Um, along with Mary Eneg, there was a fellow, Fred Kumaro, who she, I believe, worked with, uh, and he was the one who finally convinced everybody to get off trans fats. And he lived to a ripe old age, God bless him. And when he was a hundred years old, the World Nutrition Journal published My Diet, written by him, and they noted that they had never before published dietary advice, but he was so well regarded in the nutrition research world that they thought it would be interesting to hear what he had eaten on his way to a hundred years old. And I'm interested in it too. So what Sorry, I called this up. I didn't plan on getting into this, but um, one of the first things that he tells you not to do is eat lots of omega-6 fats. He says, quote, average consumption of fats in the U.S. has increased sixfold since 1912. Polyunsaturated fats are e easily oxidized. Oxidation can also occur in fats that have been overheated. You know, the overuse of these fats causes the formation of toxins, which adhere to the food being cooked. You know, so 
Did this suggest that increasing polyunsaturated fats in the diet will not prevent coronary heart disease, but may have that opposite effect, which is of course what the research shows us. Um, you know, he managed to win the battle on trans fats, God bless him. There's amusingly enough, actually only one study comparing the health effects of trans fats to omega-6 fats in an animal model that was done a few years ago. And the trans fats were the healthier alternative. Which is interesting, isn't it? Think yes, given that, made, you know, that's you what we're told to about, eat now. You were talking about Harvard, you know, we've got Walter Willett there, you know, really pushing this plant-based diet. And, you know, if we could get Belinda Fete onto, you know, onto that subject. But in this book of Mary's, she's got lots of statements from Walter talking about saturated fat intake and there's no relation between saturated fat intake and the risk of coronary heart disease. And these are all quotes, you know, well, as early is that, as... Is that Walter Willett you're quoting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And these are as early as, you know, 1995. And yet, you know, he's the one out there really pushing us not to eat animal animal foods and you know just really concentrate on a plant-based diet so it's rather intriguing i think yeah i mean you know you can certainly you know they're in the jains in india have been eating a vegetarian diet for thousands of years it certainly can be a healthy pattern um i shared an office with a Jain long ago for two and a half years. And from him, I learned more than from anybody else about the health issues with a vegetarian diet. They are very well aware of it. And one of the reasons, one of the things that they know they have to do is eat dairy fat, right? And given their, you know, it's motivated by a desire, uh, ahimsa is the word for it in Hindu, uh, not to harm. So, Dairy doesn't harm the cow, so that's an acceptable food. Uh, you know, the Jains discovered or deduced microorganism thousands of years before we in the West did because they figured that something must be causing milk to change, you know, from milk to yogurt. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's a reasonable thing for them to do, given their beliefs. Um, but what's not reasonable is trying to force the change in a population without understanding what the effects are going to be, which is what they've done in the United States. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, up until recently, an Indian vegetarian would know that he had to consume full fat dairy to be healthy. And now they're being told by research largely motivated out of the United States that they should switch over to these seed oils. And coincidentally, they're experiencing this explosion in diabetes and obesity. Now, there is an Indian researcher named uh, Malhotra, different from the Asim Malhotra you may have heard of. He published back in the 1960s. And one of the first things that he noted was that, but Indians who eat lots of full fat dairy fat have a much lower rate of cardiovascular disease than Indians who eat a high carb seed oil diet who are seven times, seven to 15 times more likely to get cardiovascular disease. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Basically all the, all the evidence that countervails the, this narrative gets tossed. Um, and I don't entirely understand what motivates the people who do that, because one can go back a long time in the medical and scientific literature and find evidence that this is that what we're doing is a bad idea and produces bad outcomes. And yet we keep doing it. Well, I'd like to move on to cardiovascular disease. But before I do that, can I just clarify something you have mentioned a couple of times earlier, which is that animals eat the plants and then create these omega-6 fats, which then we eat. But when you're talking about that, you're talking about grain-fed 
animals, aren't you? Not animals just eating the grass. Well, even grass has some omega-6 fats, right? But it has yeah. the amount that, we're, that we expect. So yes, the real problem yeah. is when you switch animals from their a more evolutionarily appropriate diet, I like to put it, to eating massive quantities of grains. And, you know, I mean, they actually supplement animal feed with seed oils, right? Yeah. And yeah. for a ruminant like a cow, um, their digestive process somewhat protects them from this, right? Which is why cows, cattle don't tend to have as much omega-6 fats as other animals. Um, unfortunately, if you're a chicken or a pig or a person, you don't have that protection. And so the more of it you eat, the more of it will make it into your body and accumulate as you continue to eat it. So yes, the real, I mean, if you compare, say, an industrial raised pig to a traditionally raised pig, the traditionally raised pig is going to have much lower levels of omega-6 fats because it's not it's not being force fed all this stuff. That's good. I just wanted to clarify that because I don't want people to suddenly think they can't eat meat either because it, it might be too high in uh, food. No, it's, know? it's, it's a crucial point. It's very important to understand it. And I mean, personally, it's one of the reasons why I tend to avoid chicken and uh, most pork and focus more on red meats and fish mm -hmm. like lamb, New Zealand lamb grass fed. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> wonderful. You can't feed lamb grains, I don't think. So, so they have to be grass fed. So it's pretty good. Yes, it's a real treat when you find it in the store up here. Yeah. We're a bit you guys need to stop world. eating it all. Send it up here to us. <laughs> <laughs> wow, they're trying really hard to get us to stop eating meat over here. We have a very vegan based um, momentum going at the moment. So doing my best to counteract it well you're lucky so, you also have some of the best nutrition researchers i know of uh grant schofield works with a fellow george henderson who yep. whose work i've been following for years and they're really doing god's work down in new zealand uh, we're pretty lucky all right and we've got australia pretty close so we've got some pretty amazing people over there as well you know yep absolutely so we are we are lucky and all this stuff makes it really accessible, you know, people like you taking the time out to come and talk to us. Um, you know, that's so appreciated that we get access to people like you. All right. My pleasure. Heart disease. Tell us about, tell us about atherosclerosis and, you know, plaque and omega-6 oils and, you know, that, that association. Yeah, so let's, okay, heart disease. So we've all heard that LDL causes heart disease. Um, and we're all told that we should pursue courses of action that will lower our LDL. Um, back in the 1980s, a couple of scientist doctors named Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor. Uh, and it was thought that this was one of the first steps in atherosclerosis is the formation of what's called foam cells. Foam cells are white blood cells that have hoovered up lots of fat and they become bloated. And I guess they look like foam, foamy under a microscope. So they got that name. So after getting their Nobel prize, one of the first things that Brown and Goldstein decided to do was demonstrate that LDL caused white blood cells to turn into foam cells. And that would demonstrate the beginning of the progression through atherosclerosis leading to, you know, full on heart disease. The only problem is it didn't work. Uh, LDL does not cause white blood cells to turn into foam cells. Um, and another couple of scientist doctors, uh, Steinberg and Whitstam figured out, now Brown and Goldstein noticed noted that only what they called modified LDL caused um, white blood cells to turn into foam cells. Now, along came Steinberg and Whitstam, and they narrowed it down to an oxidized fat that caused the change in LDL from normal LDL that does not induce 
uh, atherosclerosis to the quote unquote modified LDL. And sure enough, it was our old friend, the omega-6 fats and seed oils. Uh, they went on to do experiments in rabbits, feeding them either, I forget what seed oil they used, and, or olive oil. And they discovered that only the seed oil fed rabbits were susceptible to having their LDL oxidized. And then they did the same experiment in humans and discovered the same thing, which has been reproduced at least five or six times that the more seed oils you take, the more susceptible to oxidation your LDL becomes. Other scientists have figured out that what's actually seems to be happening here is that the seed oils that we eat uh, are oxidized on their journey through our intestine into our bloodstream. And that's the source of the oxidized fats that induce atherosclerosis in our bodies. So now this is basic cardiology. Um, I will be shocked if you can find a cardiologist, nevertheless, who is aware of this. Steinberg went on to try to treat this problem by convincing Merck to market the first statin. So the rationale behind a statin is to lower the amount of LDL in your blood so that it is less susceptible to ox so that the omega-6 fats in it is less susceptible to oxidation because that's the recognized step that has to happen to in initiate uh, atheros atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, Which is... Why they turn that around and say, oh, you should eat more of this stuff that, you've, that we have already demonstrated is bad for you is a mystery. Um, Many of, I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of a fellow named Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys was a leading proponent of the idea that saturated fat caused heart disease. And his solution was to promote vegetable oil or olive oil, which is a much better way to go. Um, he had lots of issues over the course of his career with people not believing what he was saying because he was doing it, you know, first he did this kind of survey of the existing literature and people pointed out all the problems with that. And then he did this epidemiological study and people pointed out all the problems with that. So then he decided he would start an experiment in humans and he would take people and feed them vegetable oils. And therefore he would show that this was the thing to do for everybody. Thus came about what's known as the Minnesota coronary experiment. So it didn't work out all that well. Now I will say, you know, if you're focused on LDL, then seed oils are very good at lowering LDL. There's no question about that um, in animals or in people. Um, and in the Minnesota coronary experiment, indeed feeding the, what they call the intervention people, the people who were the subject of the experiment and not the control vegetable oils did indeed lower their LDL. Unfortunately, as has been seen in other such studies, they also died faster often of coronary disease. So while Ansel Keys sadly didn't elect to share that information with the world, uh, the final paper from the Minnesota coronary experiment made no mention of those findings. And it wasn't until a few years ago that a National Institutes of Health researcher, Christopher Ramsden, contacted the son of the, one of the co-principal investigators uh, and was able to unearth what the research actually said. And lo and behold, the people who were fed more seed oils had worse outcomes. So that is, I think, the second study that showed that seed oils were bad for you where the results were suppressed. The other was the Sydney Diet Heart, st heart Study and the same NIH researcher also found the real results of that study um, and has published all of this stuff since then. Um, so there's, you know, a long history in the published medical literature showing that consuming seed oils is bad for your cardiovascular disease. Now it's interesting that people publish uh, studies, epidemiolo epidemiologists publish studies that show that 
if you have more of these fats in your blood that you're going to be healthier, right? So there was a group down in Australia. Uh, the paper was Hodge uh, et al. from 2007, as I recall. And what they looked at was diab was people with type 2 diabetes. And similar to these epidemiological studies, they found that people who had type 2 diabetes and incidentally were obese had less of these fats in their body, right, in their blood. That's very interesting. But they ate more of them, which suggests that as has been seen in a number of disease processes, right, the linoleic acid itself isn't harmful, but when it breaks down into things, that's what causes the damage in your body. So in these Australian diabetics, they ate more seed oils, but they had less of it in their bloodstream, yet they were more diabetic and more obese. So of course, we all know the connection between diabetes and heart disease. It's one of the leading risk factors, as of course is insulin resistance, which we also know now is induced. If you want to induce it, you inject someone with seed oils. So you wind up with this rather interesting path of evidence in the medical literature that points in one direction, while the medical authorities like the American Heart Association make up research essentially, which is what they've done to point us in the other direction and ignore the research that doesn't correspond with their story. Why they do that, I can't begin to fathom. We're the same here. Last year, our Heart Foundation published a paper about further encouraging the use of seed oils in the diet, restrict meat, restrict saturated fats. They had 37 studies in their reference list, six of them related to the consumption of meat or fat in the diet. None of those six showed any correlation whatsoever. In fact, some of them said, you know, there was no correlation. But the rest of the research was all about climate change and all sorts of other touchy feely things, but nothing actually to do with, with heart health and mortality. And then they say, oh, well, you know, we've got to consider more than just health. We've got to consider animals and, and the climate. And so therefore we'll make these recommendations. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I live in Idaho now. Uh, and Idaho is world famous for its potatoes. Um, much to my surprise, it's also a major beef and dairy state. And I'm a big fan of camping and being in the outdoors. And most of the time when I'm out having my adventures, I'm on land shared with cattle because cattle will go out and uh, eat land that can't be used for anything else. Um, but what's really interesting is I go into cattle country and I can see lots of wildlife and birds and all sorts of plants and you know, to anybody who follows my Instagram feed, you know, I take all these pictures of these beautiful wildflowers. Lots of it, as a matter of fact, are toxic to cows, which is why they're still there. <laughs> but, um, then I go by a potato field and it looks like the surface of the moon at this time of year because they haven't planted the potatoes. So the first thing they go through is they kill every living thing on that piece of land how you can argue that that is, you know, step one of that process is wiping out the environment. That's step one, as opposed to the cows who go out and, you know, live with all the other critters. You know, I recently saw some pronghorn antelopes running around in the neighborhood of some cows that were up on this uh, table land where I was going to camp. Um, yeah, that's another mystery to me because it's clear that plant-based agriculture is, you know, I grew up in the United States listening to all the concerns about how much soil we were losing because of our plant-based agriculture. Um, it doesn't make much sense to me, frankly. No, the problem is it's so hard to counteract, you know, the media forces are out there and, you know, I mean, we've literally got our whole government is literally behind this movement. So 
you're sort of doomed before you even start, really. Well, you are, but you aren't, right? I mean, they... Um, one thing that I learned over the course of the paleo diet movement, which I was a big fan of early on and still eat that way myself, even though it's gone a little out of fashion. Um, I recently went to the supermarket and I saw gluten-free Oreo cookies made by Nabisco, the manufacturer of Oreo, but they weren't in the gluten-free ghetto section. <laughs> One used to have to go to the supermarket and hunt for the gluten-free section, you know, if you're me and you can't eat any wheat. But now the gluten-free Oreos were out in the aisle with all the rest of the foods. They're right next to the regular Oreos. So that was a battle that, you know, we won. The people spoke and they said, we want this alternative. And the manufacturers, regardless of what the government says, have turned around and provided it. And, you know, there are now... Um, you can find, you know, uh, there's a company in Connecticut where I used to live called Lesser Evil that makes coconut oil, uh, uh, coconut oil popcorn, which is quite delicious. And you can find uh, potato chips that are fried in avocado oil or olive oil. Um, they're listening. It's coming around. You just, I don't know that the change that needs to be made is going to be made through our governments who appear to be impervious to either our desires or to the scientific evidence. But the food manufacturers are looking to sell to us and they will make, they, we know, note what we are trying to do. And a lot of them are making changes because they're, they want to eat healthier foods also. I heard a great discussion about, uh, the company that made Epic bars got bought by General Mills and, you know, everybody was all worried about what changes General Mills was going to make to the Epic bar. And one of the things that the Epic bar people realized was the General Mills people also wanted to eat healthier and they recognized that there were some problems with what their products were. Well, I do think a lot of where we're at now has been a result of that misinformation right through from the 70s, 80s, 90s. And the food manufacturers have only responded to the saturated as fat is bad, it'll cause heart disease, take it out, replace things with sugar. Um, and so it's, you know, to some extent, they've only been responding to that message. And they're also under a huge amount of pressure from the government to re you know, they've spent billions of dollars reformulating their products to correspond to the dietary guidelines with which <laughs> one has to remember were initially supposed to reduce obesity. Gee, how'd that turn out, guys? Um, so, I mean, they do respond to pressure. It's just, you know, they you know, they're not allowed to make certain health claims. And there are lots of, you know, at least in the United States, you know, organizations like the military and the schools and hospitals are only al al legally allowed to, fo to offer food that follows the dietary guidelines, which, you know, there are a few doctors uh, like Mark Kukazella in West Virginia, who, believe it or not, his hospital had a contract with one of the big soda companies to have to offer the patients soda, right? I mean, seriously, hyperglycemia is one of the leading health, health risks in a hospital. And they have a contract with, a, with Coke or Pepsi <laughs> to offer the patients Coke and Pepsi. That's nuts. But he was, able, he was able to get the hospital out of it and to start offering you know, healthy alternatives. It's, that's a start. Yeah, well, James Mukey's doing great work in Australia. You know, I mean, he's really using his, um, you know, his position to really start getting some changes made. And I think once that happens in Australia, we'll see some transition over to New Zealand as well. We tend to sort of follow in their footsteps quite a lot. So, you know, I think it is it is happening. And, and podcasts like this really have, you know, really help, and there's so many of them out there, you know, people are educating themselves, all these citizen scientists out there, you know, which I think is good. Well, it's, unfortunately, it seems to be, I mean, well, I shouldn't be too harsh. I mean, there are, 
there's an enormous literature on the problems of seed oils and health. And there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of papers looking into it. And there are, I just did uh, an interview myself on a podcast of a researcher, Bruce Hammack, um, who is funded by the US government to try and address the opiate drug use epidemic that we have. And in the interview that I did with him, he was quite clear that this is a major health problem. And based on his research, a major, you know, this overconsumption of seed oil seems to be a major driver behind the chronic pain epidemic that we're seeing in the United States that has driven this opiate overuse epidemic. Um, so there are guys out there addressing it. And he was, he was, he and his colleague uh, were thrilled to get this message out. And, you know, and they note, and they were very fair about it because they noted, you know, he was quite clear. He said, look, seed oils are feeding the world right now, even with the negative health consequences. And, you know, they can't just go away tomorrow. We need to work to come up with healthier alternatives because there are, you know, in the Amer in the United States or New Zealand or Australia, we're wealthy countries and we have problems of eating too much, but most of the world still has problems where they can't get enough food to eat. And we need to, you know, ideally we can come up with a solution to allow places like India where, you know, a lot of people are still food challenged to have healthier alternatives to things like soybean oil. Yeah, because the problem we're seeing is through these other countries is the increase in these modern diseases. So they're not dying of starvation, maybe, but now they're dying of chronic disease. Yes. So, right. We've tra traded one ill for another. And I suppose I'd rather, given that choice, uh, live to 80 with, you know, heart disease and diabetes than die at 20 from starvation. But one would like to think we could come up with a third alternative. I'm sure we will eventually. You mentioned at the beginning, and you were just talking then about, you know, with the association with like the opioid epidemic, well, the pain, I guess. But you mentioned in the beginning about your carb cravings went away when you stopped eating seed oils. Is there a mechanism for that, do you think? Oh, yes. It's very well demonstrated in the animal models and in human models. Um, so linoleic acid converts to... Uh, arachidonic acid, which is the long chain uh, form of omega-6 fats. And that is converted in your gut into a chemical called 2-AG. 2-AG, um, nobody's ever heard of, but it is the your body's own uh, answer to THC, which everybody's heard of because it's the active ingredient in marijuana. Um, so THC, I can't remember at the moment the name of the drug, but THC is a prescription drug to induce eating in people with HIV or uh, who have anorexia. So it's a human prescribed drug to induce overeating, right? Which is the effect that it has in animals. If you inject either THC or 2-AG into an animal that's eaten to uh, fullness, it will start eating again. They literally tell your body that it's starving and that it has to eat. Um, back in the 2000s, there was a drug introduced called Ramonabant. Uh, Ramonabant was an endocannabinoid inhibitor. So this 2-H THC is obviously called a cannabinoid because it comes from cannabis, the plant, right? Marijuana. Um, 2 AG is an endocannabinoid because it's the same chemical or similar chemical made by your body. And Romanoban is a endocannabinoid inhibitor. So this was a revolutionary anti-obesity treatment for humans. Um, it cures obesity in animals. Um, unfortunately, animals don't have rats in a cage, don't have a great opportunity to commit suicide if they would like to. The people in the wild weren't so restricted and it was pulled from the market because of the negative neurological effects it had. Um, it's a clear demonstration that there's, and what, it's a clear demonstration that there's a pathway to obesity through your brain, right? Because that's, you know, your brain and your gut is where this drug has its effect. Um, 
what does this thing do to you? Well, anybody who has, so I hear, smoked pot gets the munchies. They want to eat. And you don't get, when you get the munchies, you don't want to eat a steak. You want to eat junk food. You want to eat a bag of Doritos or something like that. Um, and sure enough, in the animal models, uh, 2-AG induces rats and mice to crave sweet, starchy foods. So there I was, stupid Tucker the rat, eating all of my seed oils and craving starch and sugar. And when I stopped eating it, the cravings went away in days, and as did my inflammatory bowel disease. And there are lots of connections between that and seed oil consumption. So yes, if you look at you know the epidemiology of what we've been eating in the United States, red meat down, chicken up, animal fats down, <laughs> vegetable fats up, and the excess calories that we've been eating have come from basically carbohydrates. And we've been on a diet that is pretty well demonstrated in the scientific literature to make us crave carbohydrates and to overeat them. So that's, you know, unfortunately the human model, the human um, studies haven't really been undertaken to demonstrate that uh, pathway, but we did have that drug uh, which was prescribed to humans and did work. And, it's kind of an open and shut case in the animal scientific literature, which is of course why that drug was approved in the first place. Wow. So what's your thought, you know, we've got kind of opposing views nutritionally. We, we, you know, we have high carb, low fat, and we have, you know, low carb, high fat. What's your thought about about that do you when I you know when I was at uni we learned about the Randall cycle so that you, you shouldn't eat carbs and fat together because of the you know the conflict they compete right you know. um what's your thought about that you know can people get away with high carb higher carb diets if they do go low fat or do you think it's just really the seed oils and carbs and saturated fat aren't a problem uh, that's, you've really nailed the key question in this whole topic. Um, either a high fat, either a high carb or a low carb diet can be a healthy diet. Um, we have population models, including the Japanese who were eating 84% carbohydrates and were lean and healthy. Um, their health declined after the end of World War II, when obviously Japan was conquered by the uh, American army. And we decided to try and make the Japanese more healthy by convincing them that they should eat seed oils. Um, heart disease skyrocketed in the parts of Japan most affected by that decision. Uh, the island of Okinawa, where we still have a military base, was where the Blue Zones folks went to uh, try to prove fallaciously and fraudulently that a vegetarian diet was healthy. They were the longest lived population in Japan after the introduction of the American junk food diet. The first junk food restaurant, I'm, I'm, the first McDonald's was opened in Okinawa nine years before Tokyo because the American soldiers living there wanted to eat American food. Um, turns out, the amazing thing about American food is everybody loves it. And the Okinawans started eating it and had a massive increase in obesity and diabetes and cancer and heart disease. And they suffered an epidemic of parents burying their children because of this dietary change. Um, in the course of that, their meat consumption went down. <laughs> as did their carbohydrate consumption. Um, in Japan as a whole, since the end of World War II, their car carbohydrate consumption went from 84% down to 55%. Their seed oil consumption went way up. Their diabetes rate went up tenfold. Um, so yeah, you can, you know, I really do think it is the seed oils. I will say that there's clear evidence in the animal models that 
a seed oil diet that is high in carbohydrates is far more harmful than a high N6 diet that's low in carbohydrates, right? So if you are diabetic and you want to reverse your diabetes and the associated diseases with it, then the most effective thing you can do is lower your carbohydrate consumption because you are intolerant to processing it and also to lower your omega-6 fat consumption because that's what's causing your problem, right? So while it remains to be seen in longer term, um, ideally, if one went on a low omega-6 fat diet, you would still be able, you would be able to consume carbohydrates and still be healthy or still be healthier. I mean, there are definite problems with a high carbohydrate consumption, you know, not the least of which is ca- is uh, cavities. Yeah. To anybody who says to me that, you know, carbohydrates and sugar are healthy foods, all I can say is any food that rots your face, which is what's happening when you're getting cavities, can't be called healthy. And it may be your best alternative given the diet that's on offer where you live. And I understand that, but let's be honest about it. And then I guess there's a difference between, you know, starches with fiber and maybe, you know, a minimal amount of fruit and vegetables compared with, you know, all these sort of wheat based, grain based products as well. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are, you know, nutrition's not easy. There are lots of interactions between lots of different parts of um, what we eat. And they're not all obvious and they're not all described in the scientific literature. I mean, there's, you know, really interesting. I just came across a paper today from 1961, looking at the effects of different types of fats on atherosclerosis. And they said, you know, clearly linoleic acid is inducing atherosclerosis, but in order to see that effect, you had to consume it with some degree of saturated fat. That's interesting, right? I mean, that would explain why the American diet is so uniquely bad. It explains why, uh, for instance, Asian Indians, Asian Indians don't get obese the same way that Americans do, but they sure do when they move to the United States and start eating an American diet. So, you know, it may be that's what's protecting them is a lower saturated fat diet in the context of a high seed oil diet. Um, But it certainly doesn't protect them against diabetes and heart disease. Mm, I guess there'll be a whole lot of other mechanisms to tease out on that. But, you know, we're really at the, we're really just learning about this stuff, aren't we? You know, nothing, nothing is definitive. I think none of us can really go out there and say we know the answer. We can just sort of keep trying to keep an open mind and follow the evidence. Well, but in my, you know, in my experience, so I was, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a chief technology officer, and I was also uh, developed a risk analysis engine for my company. And a lot of the, a lot of what we did in that context was similar to what they're trying to do in nutritional research. Um, And there's something called the black box analysis, right? Where you have a system and you can't see what's happening inside of the system. So all you can do is alter the variables to try and improve what's going on without knowing what's going on. And you often don't need to know what's going on inside the system. Um, And the first thing that we would always do when we had a problem with one of our systems was try and figure out if one of the inputs had changed and then revert back to the known good input. And that would almost always solve the problem. Um, And that's not hard to do with the human diet, right? I mean, you know, the paleo diet's gone a little out of fashion and folks will say, oh, but we know what cavemen, we didn't know what cavemen eat. They were living all over the world. They ate all sorts of diets. And yes, that's all true, which tells us that people can be healthy on a lot of different things, but we do know without a doubt what they weren't eating, right? They weren't eating seed oils. They weren't eating industrially processed, refined grains. They weren't eating refined sugars. And Those three things, you know, they weren't eating lots of refined wheat. Um, And those things, if you take them out of a human diet, people get better. (laughs) 
no matter where they are. I mean, that's been shown in Australian Aborigines. It's been shown in uh, Eskimo populations, and it's been shown in, you know, Germans experimentally. This isn't that hard, right? We know what was added as people got sick. And we know that if you take it away, people get better. So we, you know, all these interactions and all this stuff that we love to talk about and geek out is cool to know. And it's nice to understand why these things are happening, but I don't think we need to know them to fix what's happening to us. Um, we do get into issues like, you know, what uh, Professor Hammock mentioned in my discussion where we're, we don't have enough calories to consume without these vegetable oils. That's a rather intractable problem in the short term. But at least if we understand the problem correctly, then we can work in the direction of solving it and not, you know, it's like they say, when you're the first rule of holes is when you're in a hole, stop digging. Well, we need to stop digging. <laughs> we yeah. need to keep stop going down the same path that has gotten us all overweight and sick and diabetic. And I think what, you know, you were just talking then, you know, about the Aborigines being able to reverse, you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity. And, you know, that brings me to Western A. Price's trip when he was in New Zealand and, you know, did comparisons between the, um, between Maori who are eating a more, New, you know, a more Western diet and those who are eating a traditional diet and, you know, the dramatic difference in how short change in height, facial um, features, teeth, teeth, and, you know, we've got a real um, health crisis here, which I think if we could perhaps get that message out a bit better would really help solve that. Yeah, well, I, I've looked at documents recommending that uh, Inuit in Canada, Eskimos in Canada, who have been nearly wiped out by adopting adopting in modern American diet, um, and the nutrition advice for them is to eat more fruits and vegetables. Well, they weren't eating any fruits and vegetables before we got there because they don't have them except for you know the occasional handful of blueberries they might find in the summer. So clearly <laughs> their good health shouldn't be dependent on eating some vegetables, right? Why don't they go back to what they were eating before? This is back to what I was saying, you know, just go back to the known good intakes and the known good intakes can be, you know, a high carb diet in Japan, which has its own issues, it, you know, no doubt, or a super high fat diet if you're an Eskimo, which also has some health issues, but, you know, they were way healthier doing that than they are today in either group. Good point. So the kids, the kids in New Zealand are a real concern to me. Um, the obesity is exploding. The diabetes, type 2 diabetes is exploding. What advice can you give parents out there about feeding um, it's the oh, same as you've been saying, but, you know, we'll reinforce it. So I have two daughters. Um, and so I recognize that kids are tough. <laughs> um, get the junk food out of your house. That's the first thing to do. Um, I have one daughter who's quite fit and um, incidentally lives in Japan and the other daughter who's a bit overweight and still lives in the United States. Um, it's hard, you, you know, you may not, I mean, I went through this, I'll turn it around a little bit. I'll talk about my father who just passed away last fall. And he had been, he was probably the perfect patient for a doctor to have. He was on a low fat diet um, and he was overweight. He was, as I found out, once I started talking to the doctor, he was diabetic. He was at risk of having an amputation because of his diabetes symptoms in his foot. Um, 
and I put him on my diet and my diet, I, you know, I lived with him for a bit and cooked for him. So he ate the way I wanted him to eat and he lost all of his excess weight in two months. His, the doctor said, you know, oh, well, I haven't told your dad that his HbA1c is 6.4 because we don't have any way to treat it. You know, and I looked at the doctor and I said, diabetes is easy, doc. I'll fix his HbA1c. Two months later, it was normal, the same as the doctor's, which blew his mind. Um, but then my dad decided he didn't want to do it anymore, even though he told me that it clearly worked. Um, and he passed away shortly thereafter by heart disease. So, you know, you do the best, be a good example, and hopefully they will follow your example and they will recognize, um, that what you're doing works and that it's healthy. And if they start running into some health problems themselves, they will say, well, you know, my parents eat this way and it works for them and they're, you know, and they will follow your example. I mean, you know, both of my daughters have told me that they know that what I'm doing works and they follow it to varying degrees with varying results. Um, and at least I know that they both know what works and, you know, hopefully they will use that information productively through their lives. But the first trick is be the good example. That's a great bit of advice. Excellent. Well, I feel like I've taken up quite a lot of your time today. So many other things we could talk about, but um, I think this has been a pretty good, pretty good effort. And I really appreciate your time and it'll give people a lot of insight into those into those nasty seed oils and they can go and find you all over the place and you've got tons of podcasts out there and you've got your you've got your various sites um yes i'm so I'm, I'm very active on twitter my handle is at tucker goodrich and my i've got a link from there to my blog which is yelling-stop.blogspot.com and i've been at it on that blog for 10 years now. So there's thousands of articles, some of which are good. <laughs> it's hard keeping up with your articles, but I really like them. You know, Peter at Hyperlipid is really good, but I find you're able to sort of like break it down in a way that, you know, a more simple mind can actually follow the, follow the steps and the logic and, and understand. Well, mate, that may be because I have a more simple mind than Peter does. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, so we'll make sure we get all, <laughs> get all those put out there with the podcast and um, people can go and check you out. And you've been a guest on Paul Saladino's show a number of times and Diet Doctor, I think, and various others. So a lot of the people who listen to this have probably either seen you there or they can go and check you out at those other places as well. Yes, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's been great. I hope uh, I hope people find this information to be helpful. Uh, I'm sure they will. There's there's just so much in there, and every aspect of health. I mean, there's just no aspect of health that isn't impacted by these seed oils. So I think that's a take home message, really. Yes, I completely agree with that. And it's you know it's it can be a little bit overwhelming, but. And there are some aspects that we didn't even talk about, um, but lots of folks, even when they're on a low carb, high fat diet and they cut out seed oil, see increased health benefits. And there are good reasons to think why that should happen. And, you know, so I think it's, it's a good experiment to do. There is one thing we didn't talk about that I did mean to, which is it's all very well cutting out you know, putting the canola oil and soybean oil in your house on your cooking. But what about those seed oils that are in all those foods that we buy off the supermarket shelf? Because that's where a lot of them are coming from, isn't it? It's yeah, fun. it's especially a problem with salad dressings. Um, I read, I was kind of lucky in that when I was a kid growing up, I had lots of dental problems uh, and cavities, which were almost entirely limit, which were basically entirely eliminated by cutting sugar out of my diet. So 
before I quote unquote fixed my diet by dropping seed oils, I had been on a low sugar diet for 30 years um, or 20, 20 odd years. Um, read a lot of labels, you know, learn what they are. I mean, soybean oil, it's usually pretty obvious. Anytime you see an oil in the ingredient list, it's almost always bad oil, unless it's all olive oil. Um, or, you know, avocado oil is kind of a problem and coconut oil is a good thing. But, you know, read the ingredients. The processed foods are a real problem. That's where it sneaks in. And the other really important thing to understand is that the harm from these oils seems to start at fairly low levels of consumption. So you want to be diligent about avoiding them. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. I'll let you get on with the rest of oh, it. It's evening over there, isn't it? It must be, what, 5.30 or something by now? So I'll let you get on. It's been a pleasure, Susan. Thank you so much.